Sorry. So welcome everybody. Thank you for attending this public meeting on Metro's um, proposed changes on the peninsula in Portland. I'm Zoe Miller with the Greater Portland Council of Governments and I'm uh, excited to have you all here tonight and to share information. We'll have, um, I'm just going to do some quick introductions and then um, we'll have a presentation and time for questions. Um, so we have Greg Jordan, General Manager with Greater Portland Metro and Denise Beck, Director of Outreach and Communications and um, Rick Harbison, my colleague at the Greater Portland Council of Governments. And then, and then we also have Glenn Fenton um, here, although he's incognito. So, um, so we, and then we also have Tom Bell from GP Cog working behind the scenes there. So Greg, if you can go ahead and share the slides. Um, we've got um, a presentation of, um, and featuring some information about how we got here tonight and the, the rationale for um, doing changes on the Portland Peninsula. And we also will um, have, we'll, oops, sorry, we'll have um, time for folks to make comments and ask questions. Um, we have, and then Greg will give us some information about next steps. Um, we do, we, we are happy to provide a little more extra time if necessary. We did go a little longer this morning. So we'll try to get through as many questions as we possibly can. Um, you can put them in through the Q&A feature. Um, we'll also in it, allow people to ask their questions live. Um, we have about um, 27 attendees and we do have a couple folks who are joining us by phone only. So we'll try to be good about um, describing what's on the slides. Greg, can you go ahead and advance to the next slide for me? Um, so the meeting is being recorded and will be available on the Metro website. We're also broadcasting live on Facebook. So it's another way to access the meeting. Um, we ask that during the question period, if people can raise their hands virtually um, by hitting the raise hand button. And if you are joining by phone, you can raise your hand by hitting star nine. And we ask that you stay muted um, to receive the answer if, if there's going to be one. Um, and for the benefit of, of folks on the phone and people with visual impairments, we would like to have folks um, share their name before they speak. If you do have any questions about technology or you're having difficulty, you can put um, a note into the Q&A and we'll respond. But otherwise, we'll be using the Q&A tonight just to generate questions. Um, so with that, I am going to um, turn it over to Greg to deliver the presentation. Thanks, Zoe. Before I move forward, though, I wanted to ask if you or maybe Denise could just uh, remind people or, or let them know how they can uh, make their voices or comments heard uh, on this issue. Of course, being on the call tonight and giving us your feedback tonight um, is one way. But um, if you could just let them know how to comment uh, as we move forward, uh, that would be helpful. Sure, um, I can do that. Um, and so certainly if you're on the call tonight or watching the presentation, um, you can you can ask questions and, and, and Greg will answer them. But in addition to that, we're going to be having some stakeholder outreach meetings. So we're gonna be reaching out to various groups and organizations and providing opportunities to have uh, Zoom meetings. We're also going to be having updates on our website gpmetro.org and we have a specific page about this where we'll have links to uh, recordings and information and this presentation. We also are available um, by email info at gpmetro.org and we will answer those questions. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take all that feedback, the feedback we get tonight and all the feedback that we get through phone calls and, and other ways, um, and we're just going to, to review it. And then uh, Greg will get into uh, what we're gonna do with that information uh, for our next phase. Does that answer the questions so that people might have about how to, how to give us their input? Great, Denise, thank you. Sure. Okay, uh, thanks everybody for joining us uh, tonight. This is the, the second uh, meeting that we have had today. We had really good attendance at our morning uh, virtual meeting. Got some great comments and questions and feedback about some of these proposals. 
uh, many of which uh, we will take very, very seriously as we look to um, finalize these, obviously make some adjustments, but finalize these in the next uh, couple of months. But to give you a broad sense of why we are even here, uh, I'm showing you right now the uh, illustrations or the maps of the current Route 8, which is the pink line on the screen, and the Route 1, which is the blue line on the screen. Uh, we're just elevating these routes, so they're very, very clear. Obviously, there's much more transit service on Peninsula than just these two uh, routes. But we began a process in 2019 where we talked with riders and stakeholders, members of the public, um, about how these two routes in particular and how service on Peninsula in general is working or not working uh, for, for them. And so out of that process, we have developed an initial set of uh, proposed concepts for the public to uh, look at, consider, reflect on, and give us feedback about so that we can, again, make some refinements and hopefully move toward a better transit system uh, for, for Portland and for, the, and for the region. So we also have to recognize that the peninsula is changing, it's developing rapidly in new ways. Um, there's a lot more employment coming onto the peninsula and there's a lot more need to get people around in an efficient way. Uh, and not necessarily using their automobiles. We want to encourage biking and walking as much as possible as well. Um, but through these proposals, you'll see that we are working on ways to make it easier to get to the peninsula and to different points on peninsula rather than, rather than just Monument Square uh, in that area. And also we're seeking to make it easier to get around the peninsula. Um, and the current Route 8 uh, by itself as a circulator uh, does that really well for many loyal riders who have been with us for really many, many years. Uh, but we are seeking to try to uh, create a new urban circulator uh, that will certainly still serve our current riders really well, uh, but also make it a bit more uh, attractive to others who also need to get around the peninsula, maybe in ways that are different than uh, was needed 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. So with that as the broader context, uh, as I mentioned, this is where we have currently today. And I also wanted to illustrate or show you uh, some of the areas of need on the peninsula. Uh, this illustration or this graphic is showing you uh, seven or eight different sort of um, metrics of transit need, uh, all sort of consolidated into one illustration. And in essence, the darker areas of this map illustrate areas of the peninsula where there are uh, people living with some more challenges in terms of how uh, they can get around. And so uh, we want to make sure that we are operating our service and making sure it's it's going to places uh, on Peninsula where there's the most need. Now, this isn't to say that the current areas or areas that are lighter shaded don't have uh, strong needs as well, but we do recognize, and as you can see from this map, in particular, the East Bayside area, which I'll sort of highlight by, you know, moving my cursor around, hopefully you can see that. Uh, there really isn't uh, enough uh, available transit service to this uh, neighborhood. And so we want to try to uh, address that. Um, and so I want everybody to be aware that we very much have our eyes on uh, the needs of these various demographics, seniors, people with disabilities, uh, people without uh, an automobile, uh, people living in with lower incomes. They're very much uh, top of our minds as we design, um, redesign these services. And so again, to summarize where we were with the 2019 public involvement process, where we just uh, were taking input about how things were working and how they were not, here is a summary of the feedback that we received uh, in general. Uh, with respect to the Route 8 in particular, people would like the circulator to be bi-directional. Currently, the Route 8 is uh, operates in one direction, and that uh, is really inconvenient for most people. Uh, they may take a very short trip to get to a destination, but then when they want to get back on and go back home or go back to work, um, it's a long trip around to get back to where you came from. And so bi-directional service uh, on the peninsula, on the circulator is just really important. Uh, there is clearly a desire for more frequency on whatever circulator gets developed. Uh, currently, the Route 8 is every 30 minutes. That's not bad but most circulators in a downtown environment with you know, sort of adjacent, pretty high density neighborhoods, you really need circulators operating at 15 or 20 minute frequencies. And so we're seeking uh, to develop a project that would get us to that point. We also want to expand the hours of operation. The current Route 8 has very 
uh, narrow hours of operation, roughly you know, 7, 8 a.m. in the morning to about 7 or 8 p.m. at night, and even smaller or shorter on weekends. We want to expand that if possible to be uh, to really mirror most of our service, which is largely 6 a.m. to well 11 p.m. today, but we like to get this uh, to midnight um, at least. Uh, there is a, certainly a desire among loyal riders of the, of the of Route 8 to sort of keep it as it is today. We recognize that, but there's also a desire to make uh, the urban circulator, the, port, the peninsula circulator, faster and more direct um, and a little less meandering and uh, quicker to get to your destination. Uh, there's a need for greater simplicity and more straightforward routing. Uh, for those who are not used to using the 8, if you are someone who's new to the peninsula, whether you're a new resident, a new Mainer uh, or a visitor or, or a worker, sometimes that route can be really complicated to understand and figure out where it's going. Uh, we need transit service to be you know, as simple as possible. We, can't, we shouldn't make it hard to use and hard to understand. Uh, we want to improve the bus, stop, the bus stops across the peninsula. That includes adding more seating, adding more shelters, improving the pedestrian and the accessibility of our various bus stops. And so that's on top of our minds as well. We want to maintain access to the current destinations that we serve uh, as best we can, but we also want to add new destinations to the circulator in new neighborhoods uh, as well. So with that, um, our goals for this project are to uh, achieve many of those things that I just outlined. We also want to bring transit service to the East Bayside neighborhood, as I mentioned. We also want to bring transit service to uh, Commercial Street and Eastern Waterfront, where there is a lot of development activity, a lot of jobs, and a lot of um, things going on. Uh, and if we want people to come on Peninsula without their cars, we need to serve uh, the areas that are growing uh, rapidly. Again, while not sacrificing those who um, are used to service, used to used to the service the way it is, and they need to get to where they need to go as they have been. We're trying to balance both needs here. We want to, as I mentioned, um, well, let me start. Let me also say that some of our proposals are meant to improve, improve the level of service on Congress Street using. A number of our regional routes coming from off peninsula to on peninsula and leveraging those on top of one another to create really high frequency along the Congress Street corridor from really outer Congress on the west to you know, Washington and Mundjoy Hill on the east. Uh, so we're trying to achieve that with some of these adjustments that we're going to go through. As I mentioned, we want to improve the bus stops, add transit signal priority to make transit faster, and do our best to incorporate uh, working with the city and other, other partners you know, streetscape and intersection improvements that make transit work faster. We are also exploring innovative ways of moving people around, new ways of mobility, and that includes what we call microtransit. Uh, we're working with GPCOG. Uh, we're going, we hope to be working with GPCOG as long as we get the funding uh, to assess um, uh, a, a model of transit service that's more along the lines of demand response, um, similar to paratransit or what RTP uh, does for us today here in the region. Um, but that model of service is being uh, used more for uh, areas where it's hard to get uh, fixed route buses or it's not cost effective. Uh, we want to explore those alternatives for people uh, who are seniors, people with disabilities, but also general public. And we're also hoped, we hope to be working with the city and other partners on a possible autonomous transit pilot project. Um, that uh, is uh, something that uh, a technology that is coming and we want to be able to uh, develop some knowledge around it. And it would not be directly connected to this effort to reimagine the Route 8, but it would be something that we would layer on to uh, a smaller area of the downtown uh, area um, just to provide some circulation and some testing of this technology because it is coming and we have to get um, our heads around it. So moving ahead, I'm going to start in with describing the various alternatives that we are considering. And I'll start with some of the more simple uh, routes and alternatives that we are considering. I'll start with the Route 2, which serves the Forest Avenue corridor, also serves uh, portions of Westbrook, and comes into downtown Portland and terminates at the uh, Monument Square area of Portland. We are assessing a couple of alternatives. Um, uh, we're seeking input on a couple of alternatives on this. One would be to extend it into South Portland, and another would be to extend it over to the Eastern Waterfront, Ocean Gateway, you know, Commercial Street area uh, over that way. And so we're interested in people's thoughts about those two uh, possibilities. On Route 4, we are, uh, the Route 4 is the Brighton Avenue corridor in Portland. It's the Main Street corridor uh, in uh, Westbrook. 
Uh, it connects Westbrook to Portland. Again, it also terminates in downtown Portland in Monument Square or Helm Street at Pulse. Here we are seeking to extend uh, this over to Eastern Waterfront, again, over to the Ocean Gateway area uh, as well. Similar to the Route 4 is the Husky Line connecting Gorham, Westbrook, and Portland. And the Husky Line also comes into downtown Portland, uh, uh, terminates at the Pulse on Elm Street. And here again, uh, given uh, the, the, the development and activity going on uh, at commercial and at the Eastern Waterfront area, we are seeking to get feedback on extending this over to Ocean Gateway and the Eastern Waterfront area. Uh, now the Route 5 is a little more uh, of a change, and this is in uh, in response to our essential, essentially our elim elimination, our proposed elimination of the Route 1. Uh, and again, using the Route 1's sort of uh, hours of service and and the Route 8's hours of service to create a new uh, a new circulator without having to spend a whole a whole lot of money. Uh, we're essentially proposing to have the Route 5, which serves the main mall area, Outer Congress, and comes into Portland today via Park Avenue. Uh, we're proposing to move that up to Congress Street uh, and have that take over where the Route 1 operates today. So for the most part, uh, with some exceptions, it pretty much replaces what the Route 1 is doing today. And with that change, it allows us some more flexibility uh, to take the resources that we put into the one along with the Route 8 and create the, the new uh, circulator. Uh, and so that's the Route 5 proposal. Uh, similar to, well, not somewhat similar to the Route 5 is the Route 7. The Route 7 comes in from Falmouth and comes into downtown Portland via Washington uh, Street. And today, uh, again, terminates at the Elm Street uh, Pulse Transit Center. Here we are proposing to extend that in the other direction over to Maine Medical Center and to the uh, Thompson Point area where Amtrak Down Easter is and Concord Coach Lines is and also some of the new, uh, the Children's Museum that's now going up over there and other new, new things going on over there. So in combination with the Route 5 change that we are proposing in connection with this change that we are proposing and with the understanding that the Route 9 already operates on this section of Congress Street in Portland, when those three routes work together along Congress Street through the peninsula, it can provide really high frequency service along that entire corridor. And we can you know, sort of market or communicate with the public, with the riders that if you're needing to travel within this corridor, uh, you can take any one of these three particular routes and not have to wait for any particular one of them. And that means the frequency and your wait time really goes down and makes travel along the peninsula that much easier um, if you understand how it works. And so that's one way that we can make the service uh, more attractive uh, without having to spend a whole lot of money on new services. Uh, so those are some of the easy changes, um, at least in terms of how we understand them. Uh, the big change, of course, is the uh, proposed or the concept around uh, a new uh, urban circulator or, or loop. And I, because of the people we have on the phone, maybe can't see uh, the illustration, I'm going to try to go through this and describe some of the key points um, of this route. And I'm going to start, as I did this morning, uh, with the Hannaford uh, location. Uh, and I'm going to be going in a clockwise direction. So right now, as you probably know, the Route 8 uh, pulls into the Hannaford Plaza. And under this concept, we are uh, looking at the possibility of pulling it out to the Preble Street extension area. And so that would entail a bit of a, uh, a walk from the current location right in front of the store, uh, across the sidewalk in front of those uh, shopping uh, stores, and then uh, through a crosswalk and over to the bus stop. Uh, so for the direction that's going clockwise, you know, it would be a relatively short walk. We would want to install um, bus shelters there, possibly a bus pullout uh, to make it a very safe and, and comfortable location. But we do recognize that um, many people rely on getting to the Hannaford, having having the door-to-door -door service, and that you know, in many cases with with um, with shopping carts and, and food and groceries, it can be a hardship to uh, even even undertake a short walk. So we're very mindful of that, and we'll listen to the feedback that we get uh, on that point. 
But with that as a starting point, I'll move forward to the route going in clockwise direction to Marginal Way and stops by Trader Joe's. You know, there's a Walgreens pharmacy, Walgreens location with a pharmacy uh, on Marginal Way, other important destinations and uh, stores along Marginal Way, uh, including Intermed, um, and other, other locations as well. Uh, from there, we would move over to, again, getting at, to my points earlier, getting into the East Bayside area, which does need uh, some improvements in, in available transit service. We would serve the park and ride that's there that would provide a, possibly an opportunity for people to come onto the peninsula, park their cars there, and jump on the circulator to get around without having to drive further into the peninsula, which helps with congestion and air quality. After the park and ride, as I mentioned, it goes through East Bayside a bit and comes back out. It hits Whole Foods as the current Route 8 does today, uh, and then comes up uh, Pearl Street to Franklin Towers, a uh, very important uh, location for seniors and people with disabilities uh, on the peninsula. And so we would have, of course, our stops there. And then it would make its way over to India Street. Now the dotted, the dash line that we have on this map refers to a the possibility of a seasonal uh, variation on this during the uh, non-winter months or the winter, I'm sorry, the, the, the warmer months. Some of the areas up toward Munjoy Hill, um, Hill and around Forest Street can be difficult during the winter. Uh, we are still in the process of looking at you know, whether or not it may, might make sense to operate up there during the winter as we do today in some cases. Uh, but for now, I'll stick with looking at the India Street uh, uh, corridor, uh, which is where the Route 8 operates today as well. And then going to what we would conceive as a bit of a new mini transit hub over at Ocean Gateway, recall that I mentioned the Route, the route 4, the Husky Line, possibly the Route 2 uh, coming over to this area. We would not want to work with the city of Portland and with the, the, uh, the businesses over there, Ocean Gateway, to see if there's a possibility of having a bit of a mini transit hub uh, right by Ocean Gateway, um, where the, some of these routes could meet up and turn around. Uh, and so going, uh, Continuing along our counter, our clockwise route, we would continue on Commercial Street uh, going uh, toward the west. Obviously, Casco Bay Terminal is right there, very important interface point for uh, people coming from the islands. And many important destinations, jobs, recreation along Commercial Street, uh, retail uh, that we think is important to uh, bring some service to. Uh, there is a need to coordinate heavily with the city on this. Uh, there was a re recent study done a master planning effort to imagine uh, improvements to commercial street that involved that involved making it safer for, ve for vehicles, safer for pedestrians, a bit more efficient for, for all those considered, and also the possibility of some transit uh, infrastructure or improvements that would make it uh, uh, a bit easier to operate transit service through this area, which is heavily congested and difficult to get through now. So much to explore there, but we think it's important to bring service more directly to Commercial Street, given how important it is to the, to the city's economy. From there, we're going up uh, Center Street and taking a left on Spring Street. Uh, some important destinations there, including the Cross Insurance Arena, um, other, other destinations and businesses and residences around this area. Now, we have had feedback already and do recognize that the circulator, at least in this conceptualization, is not going up the Congress Street. Uh, we've heard from a lot of people that uh, there is a need to be on Congress Street, to be at the library, to be at the CVS, uh, to be at some of the other important destinations on Congress Street. And so we're taking that feedback uh, quite seriously. Uh, but under the current configuration or the proposed configuration, we would operate on spring over to um, the uh, going across State Street to uh, uh, we uh, I'm sorry, going across Spring Street over to uh, Brackett, uh, which is where the current Route 8 operates today. But as everybody probably knows, there is an important stop right in front of 100 State Street uh, where the Route 8 serves today. Uh, under this proposal, the stop would be at the corner of Spring and State, um, which is a bit of a walk, you know, up, up, uphill, we recognize that uh, to this stop. And so we've heard a lot of feedback that it's important to keep the stop in front of 100 State Street. And so we're going to try to weigh that in the context of everything else that we're trying to do here. Um, and I just wanted to people to, people to know that we are taking that seriously. Um, another thing that this route does is it doesn't go too as far into the West End as the current Route 8. And we have heard some concern about that. But moving ahead, uh, the route would continue west on Danforth Street. Um, there's an important senior living facility at Park Danforth that we want to continue serving. 
And then from there, it makes its way over to Four River Parkway and uh, serves the Mercy at, Mercy at the Four Hospital, which is expanding. And the hospital that is currently on, on, peninsula, on in the West End is now moving over to this campus at, at Four River Parkway. And so we wanna bring service to that location as well. Now you may know the Route 1 today actually enters the Mercy, for, Mercy at the Four Hospital uh, campus and then comes back out. Uh, we are working with a hospital to try to uh, site and construct bus stops that would be on the Fort River Parkway uh, uh, and provide, you know, decent pedestrian access into, into, the, into the hospital campus. From there, we move ahead to the Thompson Point area, the Amtrak Down Easter Station, the Comfort Coach Line Station, other, other destinations on Thompson Point. And then we make our way uh, back to Outer Congress and to the very important uh, shopping areas around St. John's, uh, at the old Union Station Plaza. Uh, there's, a, there's a dollar store, of course, there's main hardware, there's other important um, uh, businesses and destinations in this area, uh, including Greyhound. There's a Greyhound terminal at the corner of uh, St. John's and, and Congress, and that's an important thing to connect with, which we don't today, at least on this route. Uh, then we uh, would go right by the new entrance to, or the new entrance to Maine Medical Center, which is under construction now. Um, which is, a, we, as we understand it, is an important new uh, entrance to the whole campus. And so we would continue serving Maine Medical Center um, by serving that entrance on, on Congress Street. Now, we do have to wrestle with, you know, whether or not it still makes sense or was still needed to continue serving the Bram Hall entrance. Uh, we are going to be meeting with Maine Medical Center in the coming weeks or, or month or so uh, to get a really firm idea as to how their project is proceeding and hearing from you folks you know, as, to, as to which of these entrances really is the, is the most vital um, uh, in terms of access. Uh, from that point, we're operating along Park Avenue. Again, this sort of replaces um, the Route 5 being pulled off of Park Avenue. This would put service on the, from the circulator back onto Park Avenue. And then we make our way over to Forest and Park uh, where the post office is. Uh, a lot of important, you know, uh, again, businesses and uh, housing, residences, social service agencies in this vicinity. And then from here, it makes its way over to back over to Hannaford. And that uh, also in this configuration also provides an access point for uh, the, uh, the, the Portland Housing Authority, which is at the corner of um, uh, Forest and uh, I can't remember the street exactly, but the Bedford Street intersection and also provides an access point for USM uh, as well. And so that is the, uh, that's the circulator as we are currently uh, presenting it as a concept. I hope that, that my remarks about it were, were helpful for those who don't have the map in front of them, but you can go to the website and pull it up quite easily and get a sense of what we are, what we are uh, talking about here. Uh, so before we go to questions and answers, I will uh, just go through some timeline. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, this is uh, sort of our initial concepts uh, for some of these route changes. And we're gonna be taking your input through this process. As Zoe and Denise mentioned, we have a lot more uh, stakeholder meetings and organizations to meet with um, in order to gather as much feedback as possible. We then plan to come back out to the public and to the riders with refined uh, concepts or you know, route concepts in the you know, late winter, probably the March timeframe uh, in hopes of finalizing uh, some of these changes by that point. Uh, from there, I won't go through all the details of this sort of step-by-step -step process, but we are trying to get in position with our planning process, with the possibility of needing new funding, with the need to procure uh, additional buses to do some of these changes. We're looking at the last, uh, the latter half of 2022 as the really the earliest that we can probably uh, begin making some of these changes. So there's quite a bit of time between then, then and now, and there's certainly a lot more opportunity to provide comments and feedback about where we go with this. And so with that, I'll turn it back over to Zoe to facilitate um, questions. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. So we'd like to open it up to questions and comments at this point. And there are, as I said earlier, there are uh, two ways to do that. You can um, raise your hand virtually and I will make it, um, I'll unmute you. Um, and you, if you're if you've joined by phone, you can do that by hitting star nine. You can also put a question into the Q&A and I can um, read those out um, 
to Greg. And so we'll start off right now. I don't see any hands raised. Hey, Zoe. Yet. Oh. Yeah, hey, Zoe, I'm sorry. I, there was one last comment I forgot to make earlier. Oh, you, sure. I'll just jump back in. It was on the route too. And I just wanted everybody to make sure that, you know, one of the, we need to coordinate heavily and consult with and get approval from the city of South Portland as it relates to this Route 2 proposal, which would possibly have it extend into, into the city of South Portland. Um, we will be meeting with them at some point to see if there's interest there. Um, there may not be interest in having that having that occur. If not, that's okay. Um, but we wanted to make sure that um, this is not something that the city has uh, endorsed or has has uh, given us given approval on. Um, we still have to have those conversations. So sorry about that, Zoe. No problem. Um, so I'm going to go to, there's a question um, in the Q&A about, uh, well, so I'll, I'll read it out from Samantha Lambert. Um, will the schedule of the Route 5 be similar to the schedule of the Route 1 up to Monjoy Hill, um, currently twice an hour? Uh, and uh, yes, actually, the, the the frequency of the Route Five uh, is about every thirty minutes throughout the day. It varies a little bit. Sometimes it's a little better than thirty minutes. Sometimes it's a little little bit worse. But on average, it's about thirty minutes. The Route One is also every thirty minutes, and so it would most definitely maintain that level of frequency. There would be no no certainly no reduction in the frequency, and we might hope to try to improve it. Um, the next question from the Q&A um, from Jackie Devineau, um, she asks, will there be a, a route to the new market basket? Uh, well, there already is. And uh, the uh, new market basket, which is at uh, the new Rock Road development in just over the border in Westbrook. And if I can get my mouse oriented here, it's pretty much right here. And the Route 4 currently serves that location. We have a pretty big new bus bay built there where shelter is going in pretty soon, right in front of Market Basket. And so the Route 4 serves that location already. And also the Husky Line uh, serves that location as well. So we have two routes currently serving the Market Basket today. Um, the next question here is from um, Eamon Dundon. What is the effect on frequency on the routes being extended? Will frequency decrease on these routes given the increase to their proposed length? No, our our effort would be to uh, plan this out and and seek the funding necessary to make the extensions without sacrificing any frequency. Um, the next question from Samantha Lambert: Will these changes affect the service to all three high schools? It won't affect uh, Casco Bay High School or Deering High School at all. Uh, in general, it should improve the level of service to uh, Portland High School, um, but it certainly won't you know, negatively affect uh, service going to Portland, Portland High. Um, so the next question, so I'm still not seeing any hands up, but please Put your hand up if you would like to. I can open the line for you to to share live. Um, let's see. Um, from Brian Eng, does avoiding Congress Street improve the speed of the circulator? All things being equal, yes. Uh, White Commercial Street, Congress Street can can get congested. It's a fairly chaotic uh, corridor. Um, so in general, yes, uh, having the circulator be off Congress Street, you know, um, would in general make it operate a bit faster than if it's on Congress Street. But, you know, we are concerned with, you know, making the route as, as swift and as efficient as possible. But, you know, we also recognize that um, people do rely on getting to Congress Street and many people do have mobility challenges and, and really can't make some of these walks. So it's a, it's a bit of a balancing act. Okay, I'm gonna to go to Jennifer Flint, who's raised her hand. You should be able to unmute yourself, Jennifer. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Great, um, I live at the Butler School, that's at 77 Pine Street, and uh, it's in a Vesta housing property. And I know that there are a lot of people in this building that are concerned about these changes because they use the bus line eight to get to Hannaford. 
and they're concerned that it's no longer going to stop out here, that it's going to be too far from the Hannaford for them to walk um, when they get there. So I'm just wondering what the alternatives would be for them, because in this neighborhood, there's really no other way to get to a supermarket. And most of the people in this building don't have cars. And there's a lot of them and a lot of them have mobility issues. So I'm just worried about that on their account. Thanks, Jennifer. Yeah, we have heard, we have heard that concern uh, uh, quite a bit. And um, in addition to meeting with uh, 100 State Street, we hope to be able to meet with some of the residents or the staff over at the at that facility and, and just get a better picture of what the, what the need is. Um, we are taking that concern pretty seriously. We're going to see if, 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 a, if, a, if a route accommodation can be made, um, but there may also be alternatives kind of along the lines of the, of the micro transit um, possibility. Maybe there's ways that we can, co can coordinate with our partner OTP around things like shopper shuttles that can help get, you know, people from some of these uh, centers over to Hannaford and back um, while allowing the, the fixed route bus service to sort of uh, stay on some of the major, more major uh, roads and corridors. Um, and so we'll be looking at ways that we can make sure that, make sure that we maintain um, an appropriate level of service to those kinds of facilities. We're not gonna leave them high and dry at all. Um, so I'm going to go to another question in the Q&A, and I just wanted to let people know that for the comments that, been, that have been made in here, we are capturing all of this, so we hear you, and we're just going to the questions for tonight. Um, so next question, um, uh, this one actually is, uh, we don't have a name for, but have you had discussions with Portland planning staff about how these changes mesh with planned new developments? Also, some of the streets like center are very narrow. How might that affect route, the route versus off street parking? Uh, in, a, in a broad sense, we've had representatives from the city on our, on our task force. Um, it's been meeting over the past sort of year, year and a half as we've been working toward this, toward this goal. But we were having, a, we, were having we are having a, a very uh, specific planning meeting with city staff including the planning department, public works, and economic development uh, next week, in fact. Great. The next question is from Betsy Handley. Uh, what does seasonal mean for Monjoy Hill? So seasonal service in this case would mean that uh, the dash line that you see on the circulator concept would only operate during the you know, spring, summer, fall months, and it would not operate up there during the winter months. Um, and uh, that's in part uh, maybe reflective of the level of demand that might be uh, there during the winter months, but also recognizing that while Congress Street is certainly relatively easy for us to operate on and to do today, uh, for, for, for Street um, and some of the other streets uh, in this area have some grade uh, issues uh, where uh, operating buses can be a little more challenging. And so we're not foreclosing the opportunity or the possibility that this could be a permanent feature of the route, um, we're just going to be mindful of and evaluate uh, from a winter operations perspective if, it, if it's responsible or makes sense. Um, and then uh, another one here from Bet Betsy Hanley, of what is the most direct route from Munjoy Hill to the transit center? Uh, under the set of under the set of proposals, if you are on Monjoy Hill and wanting to go to what I assume is the Pulse Transit Center, then it would be to utilize the proposed Route Five. So again, it's doing the same thing the Route One is doing up in Monjoy Hill today, and that would take you right down to the library, which is right where the transit center is. If you were referring to the Portland Transportation Center, um, where Amtrak is and Concord Coach Lines then this is still an alternative. Now this route would stop, um, it would not go into the Thompson Point area, but there would be a stop at the corner of Congress and Sewell, which is right here. And there is a bit of a, about a quarter mile walk down to the Amtrak station. And that can be you know, okay for some, um, not okay for others. But here again, we are trying to also with the seven proposed change, this would in fact, serve roughly the same area as the Route 1 today um, and would actually go into the uh, uh, Amtrak station area. 
And then with the circulator, there's still some accessibility there to get to the Amtrak station and Concord coach lines. So there's a couple of alternatives on, with these various proposals that get you from Monjoy Hill or that vicinity uh, to uh, PTC or the Portland Transportation Center. Um, so I, this one is from an anonymous attendee. Um, is there a reason other than route rearrangement for moving the Hannaford stop from the store entrance to across Preble Street extension? You seem to be aware that this would be a problem for those of us who are old and less agile, especially in winter. Yeah, and I should have actually made that uh, part of my comments at the beginning when I was talking about the Hennifer location. Part of our motivation or, or, or the reason why we're looking at this is that uh, we, as a, as a, we are trying to operate less inside shopping plazas as much as possible. The interior of these shopping plazas are not the safest environments for us to be operating in. Uh, there is a lot of automobile activity that's unpredictable. There's a lot of pedestrian activity coming out of these stores um, that's unpredictable. Uh, these areas are uh, areas that uh, have a lot of conflict points. And although we've been very lucky and not had any major injury or incident in, 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 this, in this plaza in particular, as a general safety rule, uh, we'd like to be operating on the main streets as opposed to moving into shopping plazas or operating within shopping plazas. However, uh, you know, we weigh both sides of the, of the ledger on this. We recognize that asking people to walk out to the street carries uh, different concerns. Um, concerns for uh, people with limited mobility, you know, there's, there's a safety concern there, just getting out to the bus stop. Um, if there's a need to cross the street, of course, there's a safety concern there. So there are safety concerns to sort of evaluate on either side of this. Um, but all things being equal, if we can construct safe and accommodating bus stops that are very nearby, important shopping plazas, important shopping grocery store of the destinations, that's generally the best thing to do. Um, but again, we recognize, especially on the Route 8, there's a, a lot of riders with very limited mobility who need that door-to-door -door service. And we're gonna plan this, um, this route, possibly lay around other services if needed uh, that try to accommodate that need. Um, so the next question from the Q&A from Jennifer Pepper, I'm confused about why it's been pointed out that you need to go directly to Franklin Towers and Danforth because they are important places with elderly and disabled residents while you are removing service to 100 State Street, which is also a large residence for elderly and disabled. What makes the other buildings important and not 100 State? Well, we're trying to balance, you know, uh, the challenges of the geography on, on the peninsula and we can't, you know, serve all points uh, perfectly. Um, and I would, you know, I, I recognize that the, the proposed stop that would serve 100 State Street is uh, a little bit of a walk up the street at the corner of Spring and State. Um, so I wouldn't characterize this as, as removing service. We're still well within sort of the boundary of what is, what would be acceptable under, under most, or, most circumstances. Um, but again, we do recognize and I've heard already that, you know, having that front door stop for 100 State Street is, is vital to those residents. And we have heard that concern and we're gonna do our best to try to plan uh, an adjustment that accommodates it. Um, next question from the Q&A is from Brian Ang. Can you elaborate on your plans for bus shelter and other infrastructure improvements? After we finalize uh, the, the routes that we uh, want to advance, we'll begin looking into uh, the, uh, we'll get into the phase of bus stop uh, planning. Uh, in many cases around the peninsula, we, uh, we already have stops in place, some of which are just fine. Others need improvements from, e from either an ADA accessibility standpoint or a pedestrian standpoint or an amenity standpoint. As I said earlier, we need more seating at our bus stops. We need more shelter, we need more lighting, we need more information. Uh, and so we're gonna go through a process once the routes have been, have sort of come into final focus uh, to, to determine where the bus stops need to be and then what level of amenity um, needs to be there. I hope that answers the question. Um, so the next question
question um, from Nicole Byrne. What portion of Congress Street are you focusing on for the high frequency corridor? That's a great question, and I, I wish I had it. I wish I had an illustration that's that 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 illustrated that. Um, we'll try to we'll try to put that together for our next round of this. But in general, that corridor is, I would say, largely Washington Avenue on the east uh, east side uh, to Outer Congress and uh, the vicinity of the PTC on the west side. Great. Um, next question from Matthew Osman. My question is for line two. Why does it need to go to, into South Portland? Just curious. Well, it doesn't need to. Um, the Route 2 is one of uh, is a very high producing, high high ridership route today. Um, but we do have, and I've we've talked with a lot of people over the years who uh, would love to have a uh, a connection into South Portland without having to transfer to one of the South Portland buses. Um, and so it's in, in many of these cases they're pretty small extensions of service, and in many cases they had pretty big bangs. Uh, for the buck in terms of adding connectivity and accessibility to new points, either on Peninsula or in South Portland, as the case may be. Um, but as I said, you know, we have we had to go through a process with South Portland to see if this is something that they would be amenable to. It's not clear that they would be. Uh, and so we're going to look at other alternatives for the Route 2 as well, including, including going over to Eastern Waterfront um, as well. Um. Can you, oh, so another question from the Q&A, Alexander, from Alexander Merrill, can you speak more about what microtransit might entail? So microtransit is, uh, can mean a couple of things. Uh, one model of microtransit would be a very on-demand uh, response type service, sort of like paratransit or what RTP does for us today. Um, effectively, you know, Uber and Lyft are basically microtransit. I mean, they're on-demand services that you call up with your with your app, with with a phone app. Um, you uh, punch in for your ride, and it shows up and takes you where you takes takes you to where you want to go. Uh, another model of microtransit is uh, something we call dynamic routing. So it's a little bit more like a bus service, but it operates similar to sort of an Uber and a Lyft in that it is uh, getting uh, riders sort of uh, calling in either by, it can be by phone, it can be by website, it, it usually is by app. Uh, and that particular bus route is operating on a dynamic route based on where the uh, demand for a service is coming from. And uh, some of the most recent or some of the more successful examples of microtransit have been uh, around uh, either uh, rail stations or where there is where there is a, a high capacity bus corridor, for example. Um, but the surrounding area doesn't have really any, um, it's low density, doesn't have any fixed route bus service around it, or it's not cost effective to provide it. This kind of microtransit application, uh, whether it's on demand or a, dyna a dynamic fixed route can be a more efficient way of, of helping people get from that lower density residential area to you know, an important bus stop of some kind where they can take the next leg of their trip into maybe a downtown area. Now for the peninsula, you know, because we are, it's, it is a pretty walkable, very walkable um, uh, geography with a lot of transit service on it already. Um, the opportunity that we see for microtransit or on-demand applications on the peninsula might be for those who, who still need uh, the door-to-door -door service and can't uh, avail themselves of the fixed route services. Now we already have that available today uh, through our partner, the Regional Transportation uh, Program, which provides paratransit services here in the region and on Peninsula. But we might seek to see if we can uh, enhance that with uh, 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 improvements to what they're doing today and adding new features um, that would make it easier to access and get rides. Currently, with that kind of service today, you have to call in advance, usually make a reservation. Sometimes there is a, a window of time where you have to negotiate pickup times and drop up times. Uh, it can be very inconvenient in the end. Uh, and so we'd like to explore ways to make that a much more seamless, easy, on-demand service for people uh, who need to get to where they need to go quickly. Okay, we have another question from the Q&A. This one's anonymous. How were the proposed routes designed? Were 
their actual ridership used surveys or planning department input to the proposed route changes? Well, I would say all, all of that as we went through our process of talking with the public in 2019 and, and sort of heard their concerns about what they'd like to see the service be in the future. Uh, of course, we've evaluated and analyzed our current routes and the ridership and how that's performing. Uh, GPCOG has been outstanding with providing a lot of uh, 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 geographical sort of uh, visualizations of the peninsula in terms of where the important housing is, where the housing is growing, where the employment is, where the population is growing, where some of the need is in terms of demographic need, whether it's seniors, people with disabilities, things like that. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, the city of Portland has had a member, has, has had representation on our task force and has been advising us um, on some of these points uh, over the past uh, year or so, but we are having more uh, in-depth uh, meetings with city staff um, in the next few weeks uh, to get their input about how this uh, service should be uh, put together. And I would just, there was another question about stakeholders in 2019. And I, I did want to add that, um, so GPCOG has been part of this project as um, support for the stakeholder engagement. And we did spend a uh, substantial amount of time going out and actually riding buses and talking to every rider who who would talk to us um, and that was done also using um, interpreters um, and so so I think you know the the voice of the current riders was definitely taken into strong consideration um, another question from the q a um, from Nicole Byrne, you mentioned having buses run until midnight. I love that idea. Does that include all routes or only some of them? A big issue with the current route eight is that its service ends so early. Yeah, our goal is to uh, have the circulator and as many of our other routes as we can afford uh, to really all end at the same time. One of the, one of the challenges with our whole system is that our routes tend to sort of cycle down over the course of an evening they really should end mostly all at once so that you can pretty much rely on the network to get you to where you need to go uh, until you know, a certain hour at night. Um, our goal is to get to midnight you know, for the circulator and for the other routes in the system, but um, uh, we may not get there. But my hope, if, if we can't get there, I hope it's at least 11 p.m. Um, great, uh, another question from Brian Eng. Are you exploring collaboration with organizations along routes? For example, might Hannaford or 100 states staff help riders with mobility issues use the relocated stops? Is that, is that, is that more on the outreach side or is it on the technical side, you think? Um, I guess I read that as, are we considering working with businesses and uh, organizations to be involved. Um, and I mean, I hear that question is, I think that does get back to a bit to this question about micro transit and partnerships that might might happen in order to especially something around shopper shuttles. Yeah, I think absolutely. We want to, well, we intend to work with uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're, we intend to meet with 100 State Street um, and to make sure we understand the challenges over there. But certainly if there are organizations that can we can partner with, uh, especially on um, a micro transit pilot, if you want to call it that, um, that would be uh, very helpful. But right now we don't have anything uh, emerging on that front now. We are in, still in the process of assessing uh, the degree to which micro transit uh, or an on-demand like service would be uh, feasible and work uh, in this in this uh, area. So that just that does it for the questions um, that aren't repeats in the Q and A. Um, as I noted before, there are numerous comments, and there are certainly a lot that echo the concern about um, the route, the the you know changes around 100 State Street, around, or proposed changes around 100 State Street, around Hannaford, um, a lot of concern about the combination of um, having to travel further from the stop and um, 
mobility using mobility devices and winter weather um, and some concern about sidewalks and clearing for clearing of stops. Um, so I don't know if you want to just speak sort of broadly to those to those comments, Greg. Well, no, I think as, as I've been saying, we've heard those comments uh, this morning um, and in some of our other uh, through social media, some other channels. Um, we're going to take this feedback uh, that we get through these meetings and through our meetings with other organizations and uh, do our best to make uh, adjustments to this proposal, whether it's adjustments to the actual routes or whether it's, you know, the possibility of additional services that would solve some of these door to door um, needs that we have in certain areas. Um, we're going to really do our best to make sure that we solve uh, the mobility needs of everybody that we are uh, working with here. Great. So that is um, that is it for questions. I don't see any more raised hands. I guess I think we can go into uh, next steps, Greg. Yeah. Okay. So in general, as I as I kind of mentioned earlier, uh, after we gather uh, feedback during this process, and again meet with other organizations, stakeholders around the peninsula. We're going to take that feedback and uh, make some ad adjustments to the concepts, um, explore possibilities for the extent to which other services that can be layered on to solve some of these mobility challenges that we're facing in certain areas. Uh, and so really the next step as far as the public is concerned or the writers are concerned especially is to look for another round of uh, public meetings in probably the March timeframe. Is that fair to say, Zoe? Yep. When we will come out with uh, a refined or adjusted set of concepts to get your, uh, to have you look at and give us another round of feedback on. At that point, though, we hope that we are pretty close to, to finalizing um, the concepts uh, to move forward because we do want to get in position with respect to funding, with respect to, uh, you know, buying new fleet, uh, things like that, bus stops and bus stop improvements take some time to again, fund, plan, uh, construct if needed. Um, and so again, our goal is to implement whatever is ultimately approved uh, by our board uh, in the end by the uh, latter half of 2022. Great, well, thank you everybody for attending tonight. I can see that we're, um, that we're just about, at the end, I do see actually um, a hand up there. Do you want to take that one last question, Greg? Or, yeah, okay. So, Linda, I'm going to turn it on. Oh, I think I made it so you're going to be able to talk. You should be unmuted, Linda Atherton. Did you want to go ahead? Um, I don't know how to get it. Um, I don't know. Can you hear me at all? Yeah, we can hear you. You might want to speak up a little bit louder. Wasn't sure if I was unmuted. Um, yeah, I wrote a question down twice in the Q and A thing and it didn't get addressed. I we have problems out here at 100 State Street with smokers taking over the uh, bus shelter. And I've seen it happen downtown many places. And I'm just wondering if there's any plan to try and stop that because it means that a lot of people can't use the bus stops or at least can't use the shelters when there are smokers in there. Um, because we have a lot of people at least here with lung problems. So I, I don't know if there's anything you can do about it, but if you're making bigger, nicer, shelters so there could be even more people congregating in those that may or may not uh, have any legitimate reason to be there. Uh, thanks for that comment and question and, and we do have a policy of, of no smoking in the bus shelters. Um, it is can be difficult to enforce uh, unless we get a report uh, about people violating the policy. Um, but when we do get reports about that we do seek to um, have the situation resolved. Um, what we don't, what we lack at the current time anyway is, it, it is while it is a metro policy, um, we do post signage on our bus stops, at our, on our bus shelters anyway, that say no smoking inside the bus shelter. Um, 
what would give it maybe stronger teeth is if we could have it placed in, in local city uh, of Portland ordinance, which we have not uh, done yet, so that's, which we have not yet been able to do, um, but we may pursue that as an option in the future to give it a bit more teeth and allow the police to respond if necessary. Thanks. Um, and now we do have one more hand up here. Um, Audrey Tanner, I'm gonna, oops, sorry, I'm gonna make you, hopefully make it so you can talk. Um, okay, so I need to promote Audrey to panelist so that she's able to talk um, because of a Zoom version issue. Okay, Audrey, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Yes, good. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Audrey Tanner. I live at 100th State Street, and you've heard a lot about that. But one thing that hasn't quite come up is the fact that the population here, which is um, mainly seniors and people with disabilities, is 167. That's quite a lot of people. So uh, I would just repeat, emphasize what people have said about the Hannaford situation. Uh, it's not just a question of walking across the street to get picked up by the bus. It's, can we carry heavy groceries? Are we able to do, you know, like two or three weeks groceries or something like that? So uh, I would just add my voice to the people who spoke, quite a few of them this morning. And Thank you. Thank you for letting us be part of this meeting. Absolutely. Okay, so I'm just scanning, just wanna, before we wrap up, just wanna scan. Um, so there was, there was one other question that was a concern about South, about the proposals that involve service in South Portland um, and that, South Portland stakeholders hadn't been part of that conversation yet. Yeah, we're in the process of engaging with them on that question. Okay. So uh, I think I think that is it. And I I just I guess one other thing I just want to say based on a couple of the last comments that came in was just that I think there will be just to emphasize that there will be conversations about how to address, you know, I think I'm just echoing what Greg has said at this point, but in terms of the Avesta housing sites, 100 State Street and concerns about, and, and the conversation about how microtransit would be administered, that there are plans to do a study about microtransit, which would enable a much larger conversation and more engagement with folks who potentially would be using that. So. So as we noted earlier, we do have a lot of folks participating. So we'll ask people to keep their question or comment to uh, under three minutes. And we have both um, hands raised so, uh, and questions in the Q&A. So I will alternate back and forth between those. Um, so I'm going to go first to uh, the questions that are raised. So when uh, I'm going to click allow to talk and that should allow you to unmute yourself. Once you've um, made your comment or asked your question, we're going to mute you again and move to Greg's response. Um, and that'll allow us to move quickly through folks. So I'm going to go first to um, the uh, hands raised. And so we have Erwin Gratz, and I am uh, believe you're with Maine Public, and um, we'll let you go ahead and, um, and speak now. Whoops, and Erwin should be unmuted. Sorry, I just asked you to unmute again. Okay, we're not able to hear you. What we might need to do is we'll go on to the next person and then come back to you, or maybe you could put your question into the q and I'm going to go to Mary Gagnon, allowing you to talk. You can go ahead and unmute yourself.
Okay, I don't know why that's not working, but um, hopefully. Hello. Hi, go for it. <laughs> Sorry, it took a minute. Um, I, a couple of times I heard him say that a short walk and <clears throat> I'm a person that sometimes I'm okay and other times I'm not. I have several different disabilities and um, a short walk is not a short walk for me. It is painful. It's dangerous. It's difficult. And I like the thing the way it is. If they want to serve another area, put in another bus. That's my answer to it. So a lot of folks here are unable. Yeah, I mean, I'm talking for me, but there's a lot of people in my situation. And I live at 77 Pine Street, and I like having the bus out front. And I like being able to get off right in front of Hannaford. By the time I get through shopping at Hannaford, uh, I need a bus right there just to sit down. So that's it. Thank you, Mary. Greg, go ahead. Do you want me to just keep keep yeah, going? Yeah, I think no. I, I I definitely appreciate the comment. Um, uh, we understand that you know. Short walks mean different things to different people, and we're doing. We want to do our best to make sure that this route is a, is as accessible with as minimal walking distance as possible, but also you know serve um, uh, for, for serve as many people as we can. So definitely appreciate the comment, and we'll, as I said, incorporate your concern as we make uh, any further adjustments. Um, Zoe, if the, if there's no question, you know we can just you know hear the comments and move forward. Sure. Okay. I'm gonna go. Try to go back to to Irwin Gratz if possible. I'm gonna ask you to unmute yourself. Okay, there must be a pro you appear to be unmuted, but it's not working, so um, oh, maybe, do you want to go ahead? Hmm, okay, sorry about that. I'm going to have to move on to the next person. Um, so we have uh, Charles Scold, and I'm going to click allow to talk and ask you to unmute yourself if you want to go ahead. Hi, this is Charles, and I'm, uh, I, I live at 59 State Street, and I do want to express um, desire for, this, for the bus service to, to serve 100 State Street. I know a lot of people use that, and I think the right out front option is really best for people with any mobility issues. Um, and I would also mention that across from 100 State Street is 75 State Street, which also has a, a, a a lot of people who don't have vehicles and use the bus service. Um, and so I would be in favor of pushing up from center street up to Congress street to hit the, the yeah. library as, as Greg mentioned was maybe possible. And I think if you just move the circulator up to Congress street and then came back down state street and then over to Danforth, that would serve a lot of people um, in a way that this proposal doesn't quite, me. But um, my question is, how can we, um, how can we give feedback to this? Is there a way that the public or other groups or individuals can submit feedback to these proposals? Zoe or Denise, you want to take that? Sure. Um, so we are going to have a survey um, which we will have available um, on our website and we'll send it out a mass email and it'll be on Facebook. But in addition to that, right now, these, these public meetings, um, we're writing down all of the comments and all of the questions. And so you're giving feedback right now that will be considered. Uh, are there any other comments, uh, 
Greg or Zoe about the feedback? I would just add that we are trying to make it so there's really no wrong door to give your feedback. So when we release the survey, we will be collecting um, responses on paper um, through a number of partners. We will also um, open it up to folks to, if they want to just email responses or even give us a call. Um, we're really trying, we're trying to offer some like low tech options for responding. Um, if we weren't in um, the situation we are with COVID, we would certainly be getting out into physical locations and having conversations and talking through maps with people. So we're doing our very best to um, create a virtual version of that. And so we, you know, we'll, we'll be offering sessions with interpreters um, and, you know, we're open to feedback about if there are additional ways we can reach people as well. Definitely, if there are, um, you know, um, organizations that are having meetings that would like to invite us, um, we might be able to, you know, take part in those via Zoom. Um, and also, as Zoe said, uh, phone call, email, all of those, we are accepting feedback and then the survey should be coming out shortly. Um, and it will include, um, you know, the map so people can look at the map so they can ask their questions. Um, so I'm going to go now to the Q&A box. I have a question from Aaron with them um, regarding the two options for Route 2 expansion. How many other routes serve South Portland and how many other routes serve the Eastern Waterfront? It would be helpful to understand that context to understand where it would have the most benefit. So thanks, if I understand the question, uh, the city of South Portland uh, operates three bus routes uh, that serve their city and all three uh, and, uh, come into the city of Portland and uh, serve a section of Congress Street um, and then make their way back to, uh, back to South Portland. And so this would, in fact, if we were to uh, extend the route two to South Portland would uh, overlay those routes or maybe allow them to um, uh, do something different with their routes in South Portland. Um, the alternative, and again, if I think I understand your question correctly, some of our other routes uh, that we are, that I went through today, the Route 4, the Husky Line, are being proposed to move over to Eastern Waterfront. Um, and so we are we have other routes that are going to be uh, able to move over there. But uh, if we can't uh, extend the Route 2 further into South Portland, uh, then we would be seeking to extend it also over to Eastern Waterfront. I, I actually don't think we can have enough uh, service um, operating along larger extensions of Congress Street and over to Commercial Street and Eastern Waterfront. I, I think that's gonna be an important uh, destination uh, for uh, our transit service coming in from, from the West. Great, I'm gonna go to the next question in the Q&A uh, from Hans Bro, and the question uh, is, Parkside neighborhood is looking underserved along Park Ave. Is that accurate? So uh, in answer to that question, so the Route 5 currently serves, um, you know, the, I guess the lower end of the Park Avenue uh, neighborhood. And uh, the various routes that are on Congress Street today, of course, serve the you know, upper end of, of Park Avenue. And so the, I guess, bottom line effect of the changes that we're making really don't, um, I think, reduce the level of service available uh, to individuals in that neighborhood. Uh, the proposed Route 5 would bring it from Park up to Congress, but the circulator uh, that we are proposing would have service on Park Avenue. So I, I think that their coverage in terms of available service is unchanged, if, if not better, um, as we if, if we were to move forward with these changes. I'm gonna go now to another uh, a person who's raised their hand. So um, Eric Freeman, I've uh, given you permission to unmute. You should be able to go ahead. Hello, hi, uh, my name is Eric Freeman. Some of you probably know me. Um, it's really nice to see how this project has evolved. Um, I guess my only, my only points of, of concern or comment would be that I do think it's quite important to keep a direct connection into the Hannaford Plaza, seeing as that is arguably one of the highest use 
stops on the entire network. I think keeping that direct service is important. And, you, you know, the um, Preble Street extension has quite a few issues with speeding and pedestrian accessibility. Um, unless there are further plans to, you know, realign or, or create pedestrian friendly amenities along that section of Preble Street, I don't think a, a stop pair there would necessarily be the safest just from a mobility perspective. Um, I also don't necessarily think that seasonal route changes are a good idea. Uh, this is in reference to the section uh, going up uh, the section of Fourth Street to the Eastern Prom and then down Congress Street. Uh, I just think that that's a recipe for confusion for riders, both new riders and established riders. Um, and uh, I guess my only question would be, what are the proposed headways or frequencies for this route? Uh, I don't think that, apologies if I missed that somewhere, but what are the, the proposed service hours and frequencies for this route? Or if there are other uh, changes in frequencies for the five or the four or the two or any other proposed changes. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Uh, let me start with your first question. Um, and I, we totally are in agreement that unless we can make a, uh, a Purple Street extension stop at Hannaford, you know, safe, safe crossings, um, we will, of course would not seek to install those kinds of stops. Um, but we think it's worth exploring if there's a way that we can make that stop, you know, safe um, from a pedestrian perspective, um, then we think it's worth taking a look at. If we can't, then, you know, we're going to stay in that plaza. That's just the, just the facts. Uh, to your second question, I would agree with you on seasonal service not being ideal. I think we do have some concerns, again, with winter operations in this area of Eastern Prom, given some of the grades. And so uh, that was some of the basis for uh, putting this out there for at least consideration. Um, but in general, I agree with your point. Uh, your final question, the, the goal with the circulator is to, the current frequency on the current Route 8 is every 30 minutes. We are, our goal is to get this to be at 15 minutes or 20 minute frequencies, again, in both directions. Um, as of right now, there are no proposed frequency changes to the other route adjustments that we have uh, in, in this uh, presentation, with the possible exception of the Route 7. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, the Route 7 coming from Falmouth is a its frequency is every 60 minutes, and we are uh, going to be working with the town of Falmouth and, of course, with the city of Portland to see if we can raise that frequency up to 30. I'm going to go to another person um, who's put their hand up. So, uh, Sonia Brannon, um, you should be able to unmute yourself and speak. Can you hear me? We can. Hi, good morning. Um, thank you, Greg and Denise for everything that you've done. I have a couple questions and I have a concern. So my question is about the microtransit demand response pilot. Can Portland do this to our, can Portland actually do this due to the layout compared to other cities who already use it? And the proposal for the two, the number two bus going into South Portland, won't that hurt the ridership of the South Portland bus? I think keeping the number one bus going to the waterfront, uh, excuse me, keeping just one bus going to the waterfront would be sufficient. Keep the five and seven the way it is. And if you remove the if you remove the bus from the eight and out into the street, I believe that would be a huge issue for a lot of people who have mobility issues, um, whether if it's, you know, wheelchair, scooter, or, or just walking. And what if you cannot meet the 15 to 20 minute intervals? Once again, thank you. Thank you, Sonia. So I, 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 I heard two questions in there. One was regarding the microtransit application. I'm not quite sure I understood the question. The microtransit or demand response uh, study, which we will be going through, hopefully with GP COG staff over the course of the next year, We'll be looking at areas around the region and including the, the peninsula 
uh, in terms of where uh, a more general public uh, demand and response service would work. And when I say general public, I mean open to everybody, although it could be uh, geared more towards seniors and people with disabilities who, who really need that door-to-door -door service. Of course, we have RTP uh, doing a lot of that service today, but we want to seek to move in the direction of making it more uh, convenient and flexible uh, than sort of the typical, you have to make a reservation, you know, 24 hours in advance or more and, and negotiate pickup times. Um, it should be a little bit easier, kind of like, you know, getting on your phone or, or calling up a number and, and having a, uh, a vehicle pick you up, you know, really within, you know, 15, 20 or 30 minutes, it should be that easy. So we don't yet know what the um, feasibility or effectiveness of that would be on Peninsula, but we're going to be exploring that to see if it's something that we can, we can introduce. Uh, your last, uh, I think your last question related to the Route 8, and I believe it was in relation to keeping it in the Hannaford Plaza, and, um, and I certainly understand your concern on that. And then I think on the Route 2, um, in general, you know, any kind of improvement to frequency, uh, even, if it, even if it's layering on other, other services, is going to be the basis for improving ridership um, overall. So that's our, that's our thought on that. So I'm going to go to a question from the Q&A um, from Jensen Steele. It says, it appears the, that West Street is no longer serviced, question mark. I might need a bit more orientation than just West Street. So that would be in the West End, uh, one of the streets within, I don't know if Rick, actually, if you can provide any insight on that. Um, sorry, I just got the my you know, your internet connection is unstable. Notice so I missed the <laughs> um, I missed the question. There was a question okay. about whether West Street is is no longer on the route near Maine Medical Center and near Bracket. Yeah. So this this proposed route, this concept uh, is on Spring Street and then pretty much on Danforth Street. And so we do recognize that uh, the current Route 8 goes, again, deep into the heart of sort of the West End. Uh, and this would pull it back a bit from from that um, from that central sort of position in the West End. Uh, and again, our purpose in you know these meetings is to hear you know how much of a hardship or a problem that's going to be for people who are currently using uh, the 8. Um, so next question from the um, Q&A um, from Anne-Marie Watson. It says, currently many city sidewalks are not usable for handicapped people due to deterioration of the bricks. Is Metro working with the city on that? Uh, absolutely. As we finalize a route for this and the other adjustments, we'll be looking really hard at the bus stop opportunities and uh, making sure that those bus stops are accessible. Now we can't improve the sidewalks across the entire peninsula, but we're going to be working to improve at least the bus stops that we will be stopping at so that they are accessible uh, using mobility devices. I'm going to go now to um, uh, Ellen Murphy, um, who's raised her hand. Uh, you should be able to unmute yourself. Um. I have a couple of comments. Um, I put them in on the Q&A as well. Um, I, just to um, dovetail to an earlier concern about safety um, in the, the Hannaford stop issue, you know, it's kind of ironic to me that you talk about your concerns about safety um, for your buses going into the Hannaford parking lot. And now with your proposal, you're talking about exposing pedestrians to safety issues um, by having them have to navigate the same Hannaford parking lot. So that would be completely unacceptable unless you could figure out a way to not have to expose pedestrians to um, cars and traffic in all kinds of weather, I should point out. And also, you know, if you're coming from Hannaford, you're coming with groceries and you're going to have to be going some distance to get to a stop on Preble Street. I, I think that's entirely unrealistic. And for those of us who are dependent on Metro service to Hannaford, you know, for groceries, 
you really, I think, need to put yourself in the shoes of those of us who are carrying uh, groceries and bags and packages to access your service and why it is so convenient and um, so useful to us to be able to get on that bus right there at the entrance. Um, also, when you talk about distance to a stop, uh, you need to consider not only the absolute distance, but the terrain. When you talk about going from, when you say, oh, it's a short distance, it's less than a quarter mile from Spring Street up to Congress, that's uphill. And it's a fairly steep uphill for somebody using a mobility device, like a walker or propelling a wheelchair or even using a cane. And again, brick sidewalks in all kinds of weather. The bricks get slippery. They freeze more quickly than um, you know, other types of sidewalk material. So if you are talking about somebody who is accessing that bus on Spring Street, and again, that from the existing stop at 100 State Street up to the one you propose on Spring Street, going down Spring Street and then going up to Congress to access the library or CVS or Rennie's, you know, it's uphill both times. So please don't just think about distance, but put yourself in the shoes of somebody who is elderly or somebody who has a disability, who needs to make significant you know, progress to navigate what you are proposing that they do. We are not all 30 years old. We are not all able. We struggle. And I hope that you will take that into consideration and talk to those of us who don't have cars, who depend on your service either primarily or exclusively. So talk to us, talk to us before you make a proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. So we are at 10.59. Um, Greg, how, how do you want to proceed? We have a lot of, we have uh, six hands still up and then we, we are able to follow up uh, with the q and I mean, the, the questions in the box, but. Uh, from my perspective, we can keep going. I might just encourage uh, speakers to, you know, we've heard some, some important comments so far about Hannaford and about safety. Uh, about the importance of Congress Street, um, the maybe the the interior of the West End. So if you have comments that are, you know, we, we've heard those, we understand those, we're going to be taking those into account. If you have comments that are different from those, let's let's hear, let's try to hear something uh, that we haven't heard already. Great. So I'm going to go to folks on the um, who are have their hands up. So I have um, someone whose um, phone number ends in. Zero five zero. You should be able to unmute yourself and talk now. Phone number ending in zero five zero. Okay. Well, we'll we can come back to you. Um, so we have. Um, Another hand raised, Constant Bloom, Con sorry, Constance Bloomfield. Um, you should be able to unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, first of all, I really appreciate this opportunity. I would like to add to the Hannaford discussion by pointing out that you also have stops near Trader Joe's and Whole Foods. If those are to work for people, um, they will obviously be using um, portable shopping carts, food shopping carts, which are used a lot in other cities. But that will mean, I think, um, that at those stops, many of us will need the assistance of the driver to get the food up into the bus on, in, in, the, uh, in the domestic um, shopping cart. So that's one question uh, and consideration. Um, I think that uh, a stop on Danforth and Vaughn 
uh, would pick up a lot of people from the interior of the West End. I can understand why you have eliminated the West Street uh, portion, but I think you should make the loop around the West End have more stops, and I would suggest Danforth and Vaughan. In discussions of the new VA facility on Commercial Street, there have been many mentions of a possible forthcoming bus route and bus stop at that facility and a bus all the way along the Commercial Street. And I wonder about that. And lastly, I have always wondered why Portland does not use smaller and more agile buses. It seems to me as a bus rider that a huge amount of time is involved in just stopping and starting these buses, which are often um, barely occupied. And I don't quite understand why smaller buses aren't used. Thank you. Thank you, Constance. So a couple of questions there, uh, certainly with the stops or the you know, potential stops at Trader Joe's and, and Whole Foods and even Hannaford, um, you know, uh, in general, you know, uh, bus operators, you know, certainly help people uh, who are using mobility devices. But in general, you know, unless there's a true uh, urgent need, we typically would not necessarily help with a shopping cart. So we do our buses do, of course, have the technology to both uh, kneel the bus so it's lower, and then we de deploy the ramps uh, when there's a need to roll a shopping cart onto the bus. And with the vehicles that we would hope to procure uh, for this uh, new service, at least in part would have a more, uh, I guess, open, uh, open seating layout in the front area of the bus. So it would be a little bit easier uh, to uh, hold and secure some of the shopping carts and baby strollers and other things that we often get on board the bus. Um, so that would be a consideration as well. Uh, understand your question or your, your suggestion about Danforth and Vaughn, that's a good suggestion. Uh, with respect to the uh, VA hospital on Commercial Street, uh, we are in a tough position uh, as it relates to whether or not we serve the West End at all uh, or uh, we serve Commercial Street. Uh, we really have to sort of pick one or the other. And the city of Portland um, had been going through a process to look at the possibility of doing that autonomous uh, shuttle project along Commercial Street. And it may have gone uh, not quite as far as the VA hospital, but it might have gotten pretty close. And so we do know the VA hospital is coming. We do know that it's a destination that requires or should have some transit service. Um, but because the, the, the overall geography of the peninsula is challenging from this perspective, we, uh, are, have, uh, we have not yet figured out how, if or how we're gonna be able to serve that location at this point or in the future. Um, to your final question on, on bus size, you know, certainly um, there are streets on Peninsula where you know a smaller bus could certainly operate a little more easily, uh, but uh, operating more buses uh, certainly creates uh, more cost for us. And so, all things being equal, having the maximum capacity bus that we can have out there that can operate through the uh, tight city streets are are the best from a cost effectiveness perspective. Um, even though sometimes it may appear like there's not many people on there, we want to make sure we have the capacity to not have overloads. Um, and so you can either have a bit more capacity uh, or you can have more buses, which cre creates more cost. And I don't think we can uh, we can't afford to sort of do that. So the the buses, again, that we would procure for the service would not be um, the larger vehicles that you've seen Metro uh, take delivery on and operate over the past couple of years. They would be uh, smaller, uh, 35 foot um, uh, vehicles that can still make its way through the peninsula pretty easily as they do in the eight today. So thank you very much for those questions. Um, so I have another um, hand raised here. I have sand, oh, sorry, it's, this, uh, sorry, it, I, Sandy Schubert, you had your hand up, but then it went away. So I'll come back to you in a second. So I have Dave Lawrence, um, you should be able to unmute yourself. Hi, Zoe. Hi, uh, uh, Greg. Uh, just one comment. Um, I think this is a fantastic uh, uh, idea. Uh, and, uh, uh, and the only 
question uh, uh, would be um, uh, would be the uh, the eight. Uh, no, the um, uh, five root. I know uh, that you don't have a time, a extra time, uh, a extra, um, uh, a proposal for the five, but uh, I work in South Portland uh, and um, and uh, and getting to work uh, uh, and I take the five often enough that uh, I see it cr uh, mostly cr crowded on Monday mornings. Um, so I would uh, ask for the five uh, to uh, uh, have a proposal of uh, of most uh, more um, fre uh, more frequent uh, um, uh, time uh, not every 30 minutes uh, like it is now. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you for the suggestion. We certainly are always trying to improve our frequency and uh, um, we agree that, you know, the five is one of the most ridden routes uh, today and it does need to have a frequency uh, improvement and we're going to keep working to try to do that so thank you i'm going to go to sandy schubert you should be able to unmute yourself now uh, yeah my name is sandy schubert i live at 77 pine street now i have a walker so i'm not able to carry groceries from either congress street or spring street if you eliminate pine street and the Cotton Street area, you have a lot of us handicapped and the average age here is 70 or 80. You eliminate us being able to use your bus service, therefore taking away our independence. Thank you, Sandy. Um, I'm gonna go now to um, a question in the Q&A. Um, from Natalie Bogart, how easy or difficult will it be to alter this route or add stops in the future, specifically if the Amtrak down Easter Station were to move to a mainline location, could it be served by the Peninsula route? Thanks, Natalie. So uh, certainly adding stops along, if this particular route configuration were to move forward, then adding stops along the current configuration are, are, are not that hard, depending on the, the depending on the area. Um, but I think what you're really referring to is if, the, if the, of course, if the, if the Amtrak station moves to the main line, I think it depends where the <laughs> where that station ends up being. Uh, if it's along sort of in the middle of the St. John's uh, uh, area where I know it's it's been, um, where there's a study looking at that potential, it's gonna be uh, difficult, if not impossible, to modify the route to serve that, that station. Um, the extent to which it could be uh, closer to Congress Street, you know, uh, is going to be better from a lot of perspectives because many of our services, many of our routes um, operate through Congress Street and the degree to which the a, any kind of new Amtrak station is close to Congress Street in the St. John's area. It's going to be served by many, many transit routes, not just the circulator. So that would be an outstanding outcome. I hope that answers your question. And so um, we have a couple questions in the Q&A about um, connecting to remote parking and the potential for partnerships, um, say, you know, around like pay to park, um, at some of the locations that have more space for that? Yeah, I think there are opportunities. Uh, there's a lot of parking infrastructure already in the old port area, but we're not really looking to bring more cars you know, into that area. We wanna keep cars 
you know, sort of off peninsula. And then once if they're on peninsula and they're not, not moving them around too much. So the park and ride on, on marginal way is certainly an option um, that that facility could be improved. And certainly the bus stop and the interface with transit would need to be improved. And there's a decent amount of capacity there. So that is an option. There is the potential for, you know, parking, uh, remote parking uh, opportunities, probably over towards Thompson's Point, probably to some extent in the Hennepin area uh, and possibly even, um, yeah, well, I'll just, I'll leave it with those two. I think those those three areas are probably the main areas where some remote, remote parking could uh, could be, could work and could be, could be served by the circulator. I'm going to go now to another person with their hand up. So Meredith Holmes, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Hi, it's Meredith with Avesta. I'm just calling to um, support the calls that we're already in about a stop at 77 Pine, Pine and West. Um, we've had several residents express concerns about not being able to access um, services from that spot because the, the walk would be too difficult. Um, many of them are seniors and disabled, so we just want to support them. Thank you. Um, so there is a question about um, West Commercial Street and whether there will be, um, whether it's possible to serve, I, I think we may have gotten at this, but there were several questions about the new VA facility in West Commercial Street, the Star Match building area. Um, any plans for service to that? I, again, as I, uh, I tried to sort of mention earlier, uh, it's it's very difficult for us to continue serving both the West End and 100 State Street and uh, and those in those neighborhoods such as 77 Pine that we're hearing about today, and also uh, expand service to uh, Commercial Street with the circulator. Um, that isn't to say there isn't another route in our arsenal that could be modified uh, to one degree or another uh, to serve the VA. We do know the VA, as I said before, we do know the VA is coming, um, is under construction now, and is a, is a destination that we need to seek uh, or figure out how we're gonna serve in some way um, once it becomes fully operational. Um, but it's a tough thing to do with a circulator. Great, thank you. I think some people had missed the uh, initial answer. Um, so, I, we have, I think we've covered most of what's showing up here in the Q and A. Um, many more uh, comments, you know, reflecting the, you know, similar, you know, locations, um, and concerns about grocery shopping. And I think maybe Greg, I think just I wanted to mentioned that part of the conversation about microtransit has included discussion around shopper shuttles and that that is a, a strategy that's been used in other parts of the country, sometimes even in partnership with grocery stores. Um, and so certainly there's a lot of feedback today that indicates we, you know, um, that, that that will be part of the study that happens. Um, I think that we've gotten to most everything here. Greg, if you want to go ahead and talk about next steps. Yeah, so uh, as I discussed toward the beginning and reiterated a few times, that this these proposals are in some respects the beginning of this conversation. The feedback we've received today and we hope to receive tonight uh, at the second meeting and also through uh, numerous, you know, meetings that we will plan to hold with, um, you know, stakeholder groups, you know, like 100 State Street, like with Avesta Housing, um, and and others, you know, other interests on the peninsula. We are going to take all that feedback in. We're going to evaluate it. We're going to assess it, um, and we are going to come back out to the public in the, you know, early part of the or the middle part of the winter of 2021. You know, the January through March timeframe with a revised set of, of, of proposals and, uh, and hope that that uh, gets us to a way forward you know, at that point. And so those are the next steps. So you can look for 
more public meetings being announced in the in that time period, and we'll go through uh, some revisions and get your feedback again at that point. And if I could just add one last thing, um, that if you attended the meeting today but you didn't register, um, we would love to get your email. And so if you would please send a, a email to info at um, gpmetro.org so we can add you to the list. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, but maybe I'm not sure everybody heard, we are planning to put together frequently asked questions um, that will be posted on the website and also um, we'll, we'll announce it on Facebook when that is ready. So thank you everybody for attending today. Um, we do have another session tonight and um, we look forward to continuing the conversation. So thank you so much for your feedback and um, comments today. Thank you everybody. Thank you.